clusters. So again, this, this year, the theme <coughs> is hardware accelerated databases. So databases that are designed to run on not just the CPU, but GPUs, FPGAs, and ASICs. Um, so real quick, before we, before we introduce our speakers today, I want to go through the, just thank some people who helped make the seminar series possible. First of all, I want to thank Yahoo Labs for sponsoring us for our fourth year. I want to thank Hollow Point Karen for uh, organizing the room and wrangling our, our, my squad, keep everything under order. I want to thank JL from the Seattle Streets, Enya Selesh, and Ipoda Greek for staying true to everything. I want to thank KB and Little T for always helping me keep one in the chamber. And so, just want to say, if you're going to cross CMUDB, right, I'll put the other side. Okay? All right. So with that, uh, we're super happy to have uh, Connecticut speak today, right? So we have so two speakers. We have Nima and Ellie. Nima is the co-founder and CTO of, uh, of Kinetica. Um, he did his undergrad at, at the University of Maryland. It turns out we grew up five minutes from each other yeah. back in Maryland uh, from the mean streets of Ellicott City. Um, we also have Ellie Glazer here as well. He is the VP <clears throat> Engineering uh, at Kinetica, and he is from uh, alumni of, of Johns Hopkins. With that, cool. go for it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, everyone. And Andy, thanks so much for inviting us. Uh, it's a really cool series, and it's fun to be able to kick this, this year off. So, uh, you know, as Andy mentioned, we're Kinetica, and, um, you know, one of the ways I like to describe Kinetica and the problem it's built to solve is to kind of go through the origin story. So, uh, way back in 2010, uh, we were a small government contractor on this unique program that was called the Brain Program, later it was called Red Disk, and basically the remit of that program was you need to be able to consume over 250 different real-time data feeds and give a common compute capability and analytic capability to a group of developers and analysts to quickly produce you know, uh, applications and analytics that you can deploy quickly into theater. So at that time, NoSQL was like all the rage, the panacea for everything. So the, the pattern was, let's set up a huge storm topology with a lot of boxes and executors. Let's set up an even bigger Cassandra or HBase cluster, and you know, we're going to have a team of 30 to 40 engineers really spend a lot of time creating a very advanced indexing methodology, right? Um, some of those guys are database developers, some of those guys weren't, but you know, they had data structure background and you know, they essentially started this process of let's gather the query requirements um, and let's gather the, you know, the, the, the sizing effort and you know, we're confident that we're gonna be able to meet, meet the SLAs. We're confident that you know, the query inventory is, is gonna be fixed. Invariably, what happened is analysts wanted to chop up the data in a number of different ways, and so that query inventory grew. That caused the hardware fan out to explode. That caused the delta indexing time to you know, creep higher and higher and higher to, to a point where the indexing would never catch up to the data stream, right? And every time that would happen, after two or three times, you know, they kind of got to a point of saying, hey, what do we do here, right? We've, we've, we've kind of gone through this cycle three times now with different underlying technologies, slightly slight modifications to our indexing approach. And uh, you know, we were there, like I said, in a geospatial context, and um, I had a background in GPUs, and at that time, GPUs were really kind of coming of age. Uh, it's the Fermi chipset, so it was really, you know, it's, you know, maturation, you know, you know kind of uh, inflection <coughs> point from a, you know, maturity standpoint. So I said, look at this device. It's insanely powerful from a compute perspective. Instead of making a database that's trying to maintain these advanced data structures so that when it's query time, we minimize how much compute we use, let's make a database that uses compute as an abundant resource where uh, we're going to try to feed this device as fast as possible across many nodes and we're going to try to orchestrate it and synchronize its results quickly and easily for the developer, right? So um, one of the main goals was being able to scale linearly, one of the main goals was allowing the developer to not have to learn new data modeling idioms <laughs> and not have to change their data model uh, when they're trying to achieve a new level of scale. So no denormalizing, um, you know, no five-way hash maps, um, you know, kind of the classic relational developer interaction model, um, but with the kind of new, new school level of scale and performance. So you know, with that kind of goal in mind, we, we started building out what was actually then called Gaia, um, where we really were focusing on just certain sets of OLAP operators, geospatial and temporal query capability. Uh, we were able to be that engine for that program and you know, kind of take that problem away from the, the rest of the program, which was focused on NLP. 
So as part of that program, there was a huge amount of location data streaming in, right? And location data has a lot of you know, uh, unique challenges to it. On the filter side, it's a complex filter, right? So it's not a simple range query. It's, it's not a simple kind of uh, predicate lookup. It's, it's, it can be you know, thousands of points that you need to check against to see whether or not certain points are in or whether two shapes cross. Um, and then on the visualization side, it's got a lot of unique challenges because it can't be easily summarized, right? So it's not like a bar chart or something where you, know, you can compress it down to a small data structure and feed it to a client. You have to be able to you know, usually send some large structure to some third-party application, whether it's your browser or you know, your geo server in the middle uh, to do your actual final rendering. And if, if even today, if you take you know, a strong laptop and go uh, use like Uber's Kepler and try to load up 500,000 shapes, you're going to hear your laptop fans start to spin up and feel your browser start to drag because it's still not a fully solved problem. So seeing that and knowing you know, how important location was for, for what we were doing back then, uh, we, we really focused on the geospatial processing side, but also on the visualization side. So one of the main uh, innovations that came out of that work was let's make a combined uh, Feature, you know, data processing and rendering pipe where you know, a visualization request would be uh, rendered in situ in our process space and then flattened and then given out via a web service, uh, in this case WMS. And um, you know, that with our kind of heat map capability, which was also you know, a, a very advanced visualization that um, used that same pipeline, really set us apart. And through that effort, we won this award uh, from IDC, uh, from their HPC group. And um, just by you know, sheer luck, someone at the Postal Service saw that we won this award from a press release. And Postal Service had just spent millions of dollars putting a you know, breadcrumb emitting device on every postal truck and giving one to every carrier. So they spent you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. They had a big legal fight because the, the carriers didn't want to be tracked. Uh, they went through all this effort, right, and they created this really high volume data stream. And at the end of the day, they realized we can't query this. We, we don't have the infrastructure to be able to drive value from this thing we've already invested hundreds of millions of dollars into. So, like I said, just by coincidence, they see this press release. They said, you know, come in. It looks like you're trying to tackle something that's, you know, uh, near and dear to our hearts. We learn about the problem. Uh, they said, let's see a prototype in a couple months. You know, we were able to really deliver on that, and then you know, nine months later, we were able to get into production, and um, you know, that was our first kind of major commercial license sale. Um, and from that point, we kind of pivoted as a company from you know, a primarily services-focused, government-based uh, entity to, or not based entity, but you know, focused uh, commercial entity to you know, a kind of product-oriented uh, startup where we were going to you know, focus all of our capital resources in the development of the product. So that was around 2014. Um, my co-founder, Mitt, went to San Francisco to try to raise capital, um, while you know, a team of myself, at 2014, myself, Ellie, and about two other engineers uh, continued to develop the product. Um, again, by kind of luck, um, we met a friend of a friend that said, hey, you, you guys got to go show this to Ray Lane. He, he's been in the data database industry for 20 years. He's starting a fund. He's going to get this. And you know, we, we went um, that day, presented to him, and you know, he believed and he got it. And he said, look, this makes sense to me. Uh, let's do a seed round. And from that point, we kind of you know, took it from there, where you know, we did a subsequent round and, and finally this last uh, A round. So now we're about a team of, of 35 people. And um, you know, we're, we're constantly focused on developing Kinetica and, and pushing the envelope you know, around this, this major challenge, which you know, we're going to define here as you know, the extreme data challenge, right? So if you think about what are the, what are the kind of characteristics that define this problem, it's all around you know, the, the data, right? So the variety, the volume, the cardinality, um, the velocity. So you know, it's not batch oriented, it's constantly streaming, right? And then the workload, right? So the complexity of analysis. So not a simple lookup, not simple aggregates, right? Not simple filters, but you know, complicated filters, very, um, <clears throat> very advanced aggregates with billions of groups, right? Uh, location analytics, ML inferencing, and being able to feed that all uh, into one another so that you get this multiplier effect. This is where we are now, right? And 
this is the problem that enterprises are trying to, to, to tackle now because they're, they've invested so much in their data feeds and they're saying, how do we get maximum ROI from you know, our data, right? Our data has all this intelligence. You know, why are we doing a batch report every night? Why is our entire hedge fund you know, being informed about their risk profile only in the morning? It should be real time. It should be alerting them. You know, they should be able to chop it up. They should be able to visualize it. There should be you know, constant ML inferencing going on, on against it to do you know, different <clears throat> alerts or scores uh, about you know, behavioral things they might be seeing from, from those uh, you know, OLAP workloads. So where we sit today is kind of like, I think, the precipice of a lot of enterprises saying, yes, we're going to tackle this. Because where we were you know, 30 years ago was the operational space, right? Like, let's do our transactions. Um, let's be able to do some basic triggering. Let's make sure that you know, uh, we can retroactively verify things are, are op operating correctly, right, from a clerical perspective. You know, about 10 years ago, we were kind of at the height, maybe even five years ago, the height of the kind of big data, you know, uh, experience with, you know, Hadoop kind of leading the charge. You know, let's make a huge data lake. Let's be able to have this ecosystem of components, Spark, you know, Presto, you know, Hive. Um, and let's just give it all, you know, as one big platform to the developers. And let's see what they can, you know, kind of patch together and, you know, what they can explore. And inevitably, that did move the ball further. Um, and it did allow for, you know, um, a bigger kind of appetite for the complexity of the workload and for the amount of data being addressed. Um, but where it fell down was, you know, the TCO around maintaining these solutions, the kind of the data life cycle of the reporting in that, you know, mostly was really, you know, based on batch kind of workloads because Hadoop fundamentally was really made as a batch style job system, right? So from that point, which, you know, is, is you know, kind of now kind of in its, you know, sun's, you know, twilight, we're, we're just starting to see enterprises understand that, look, we, we need to be able to take these feeds and we need to be able to derive data and have it be real time so that you know, there's no lag, right? We're able to do all the different variations of the work and we're able to feed you know, one insight into the other. And that's what we're trying to solve here at Connecticut. So I know I went, went kind of long on that, but I'm just gonna also kind of touch on all the anti-patterns we've seen trying to solve this problem. So, I mean, going from enterprise to enterprise, you see you know, these are the three or four things that we see, you know, all the time. Let me get a drink of water here. So this is a big one. Is, and you see this, like, you know, a big retailer wants to do real-time inventory. And, you know, they have billions of transactions coming in, right? Um, they want to be able to maintain a really complicated aggregate, right? Billions of groups, not you know, not 100,000 groups, but, you know, a huge aggregate table. Um, and they want to maintain possibly multiple versions of those, right? Um, and then they want to have a microservices layer that's doing very fast key lookup against it, right? So that they can inform, you know, up their stack, whether it's a report or an app or whatever it might be. So what you see in this approach is, is okay, we've got a Cassandra, we've got an HBase. It's got this incredible mutation and read scale. Just like what we saw in 2010, let's spin up you know, a uh, streaming executor pipeline that's going to consume data off, you know, let's say, a Kafka topic and maintain this advanced indexing system that we're going to either you know, uh, kind of invent ourselves or you know, use common patterns or use libraries that are out there. Right? Um, just like we saw in 2010, you see the same problems. You know, the, the ability to keep up with the rate of uh, mutation is, is you know, usually the first thing to go. But then you know, right after that is, the desire to change anything about that aggregate or add another aggregate is extremely, um, you know, expensive from a TCO perspective because um, basically you've taken an engineering group that is, you know, really supposed to be focusing on analytic and you've made them an ad hoc database developers, right? And so, you know, you're asking a potentially young uh, or, you know, let's say not mature uh, data processing solution, which is what they build, right, to add on this whole new capability. And it really is just from a developer standpoint, not, not ideal, right? And so um, this is still one of the most common things we see today. We just, we just saw it a month ago, you know, with a 200 node Cassandra cluster with a retailer trying to do real-time inventory. Question? Just so I have a little more context, like what, 
Like, can, can you give some more absolute numbers of what's what's the scale you're talking about? I mean, is this data it's a memory processor? Yeah. Processor? Is, so, you know, with our current with our current kind of profile, right? Um, you know, our traditional size cluster is you know in the ten to thirty node. It can scale higher, and we do have one or two customers that are higher than that. Yes. So as far as your query, your ability, your addressable query size is the memory of the cluster. Okay. And what what, latencies you're looking for? We're in the hundred millisecond to three second window, cool. right? Um, with our product that's coming in the end of Q4, we're trying, we're we're kind of uh, getting into the data exploration, data lake style workloads uh, with with our tiered storage capability. But you know, up until this point, you know, that's that's the space that we play in, right? Um, and so that space really makes sense if you've got streaming data coming in, right? If you need to be able to um, maintain that in an easy fashion and be able to, you know, I instrument that up your stack where you know that everything's up to date, this advanced aggregate's just being maintained for you, right? Um, and you, you've, you know, you've got the hardware uh, and the kind of the budget to, to back it up, right? And so um, it's a... It's an emerging problem, right? So, like right now, it's it's the most aggressive enterprises. It's the ones with the biggest, you know, kind of data streams or you know the biggest uh, desire to do you know real time reporting or real time analytics or a real time pipeline that can inform you know a number of different business units. Um, but I think it's going to be something where you know you know you're, you've got your kind of first movers, and we're going to see you know a lot of of the kind of stragglers you know c come on board and realize the power of of the data that they have and you know what they're just kind of leaving on the table. So the, the second one that we see quite a bit is around the traditional data warehouse like you know uh, I'm not going to mention any particulars but um, you know you got your traditional warehouse it, it was built for you know a really kind of different set of problem scenarios where um, it was more about being able to do you know OLTP and complex transactional workloads at scale. Um, inevitably, what they find is the data structures are not, um, you know, optimal for being able to have the kind of <clears throat> to, to leverage the compute capability of, you know, vectorized processors like, you know, the, the latest Skylakes or, or the GPU. Um, and on top of all that, when you bring in mutations, right, um, being able to or having to maintain that those complex data structures really makes everything fall apart. Um, this is, you know just not what these systems were built for. They were built for, you know, right integrity. They were built for being able to do, you know, really coordinated complex transactions. And they do those things incredibly well. That's not what Kinetica is built for. You know, we're not trying to target that, right? Um, but you do see this a lot, and that's, that's partially because of the initial investment. That's because that's what they know. But you see, you know, you see it fall down over and over again when it's trying to tackle this problem. So from there, there's kind of the, the newer generation uh, of, of, you know, MPP data warehouse where, you know, they're fully focused on in, their in-memory column store. Um, they're able to at least partially bring in at a, at a higher rate of mutation. But uh, what we've seen is they haven't really committed to vectorized processing. So when you need to do something like a really advanced, painful aggregate that's going to generate, you know, million groups plus, their, their kernels aren't you know, the actual underlying logic in the kernels aren't fully vectorized, so basically you, you don't have the kind of fundamental compute kernels to leverage the, the hardware that's out there today, whether it be Skylake, AVX 512, or GPUs, right? Um, just recently as six months ago, you know, one of the leading kind of cutting edge MPP databases, distributed MPP databases that I think is a great product, um, they kind of came out with their next generation release, their, you know, their commitment to you know, AVX 512 and, you know, uh, being able to, you know, leverage this new hardware. But if you kind of looked underneath in the fine print, you can see, like, it's, it's actually limited to a very certain, it's a small set of kernels and, and kind of processing capability. And, and the reason for that is it takes a lot of work to create complex group by kernels, complex, you know, join engines that can do things in a fully vectorized manner. Uh, it takes a certain amount of discipline because there's always the easy way out. So, you know, that's another major, you know, uh, kind of thing that has taken us quite a while to get to, but um, has been well worth it in the, in the sense that 
our, our kernels are a differentiator, whether it's on Intel with you know leveraging the AVX five twelve instruction set or leveraging GPUs. Is this, is this I can bleep it out. Okay. Done. <laughs> All right. And the common one, this other common one, is really around kind of just the the location analytics stack, right? So you know we're going o over the you know the the, the new workload characteristics that we're seeing, you know, the, the new data types that we're seeing, and, you know, there's a tremendous amount of look value in location data. I mean, if you think about it, it's, it's a way to implicitly define relationships between people, between products, between, um, you know, intention, you know, it's, it's really powerful. I mean, the government actually has a little bit of a more forward-looking view on being able to kind of derive value from location that I think enterprises is now like starting to get. You're seeing ad techs really embrace location because there's just a tremendous, tre tremendous amount of things you can learn about you know someone you're going to serve an ad to through doing location analytics, right? Um, but with that, location analytics has a whole host of its own very complicated problems, and they're really on the filter side, right? So. Um, when you have to do like a complex feature analytic where you know maybe you want to join one set against another around you know whether or not to, you know any of the shapes are within whatever some buffer zone of each other uh, that's not something that you can build an index for easily without having you know misses or having hot spotting effect you know effects take place so um, what we spent a lot of time on is you know building those kernels out building that capability out to do um, that kind of brute force computation. Now we do leverage, and with a lot of the stuff we do, and, and Ellie is going to, you know, jump more into that. We do leverage indexes, and we do leverage, you know, kind of um, not commonplace, but we generate, we you know, we we generate the ancillary data structures that we feel are most um, complementary to being able to to solve the you know the question being asked. But what we really try to focus on is having both worlds, right, where. You know, we want to have these in indexes to a point. They'll help us to a point, and then when we have to switch over and, and feed that kind of you know brute force uh, table scan problem, we have you know the vectorized kernels and the and the compute hardware there available to do it. Um, Geospatial has also that visualization problem that I mentioned, and you know we've spent a tremendous amount of time um, with our EGL pipeline, you know, being able to do complex feature rendering. Um, it's something that it's actually you know. It sounds kind of, you know, easier than it is, and why not just bring in like, you know, a vector tile and bring it to the browser? But um, again, it's something that if you're looking out at, at a nation and you have, let's say, you know, a road network, right? Um, bringing all that feature data to a browser or to another solution to do the final rendering is going to crush that, crush that engine, right? So you have to have something where you don't have to pay the serialization penalty over again, where you have the compute. Right, and you have the kind of uh, complexity um, and kind of depth of capability to do the rendering, so symbologies, um, it, it, you know, all the different shape types, um, and that's something else that you know, for where things are going as far as deriving value out of data. I mean, if you think about autonomous and you know all the different major automakers trying to you know get into that field, you know, just forget lidar, just two D data, you know, analytics and visualization is a tremendous part of their pipeline that they're all trying to figure out how to how to conduct. So yes, we are, you know, the kind of we were called GPDB. Um, you know, our production systems ship on GPU NVIDIA GPUs. We do have you know an Intel flavor, but you know our our all of our production deployments leverage the GPU. Um, and the GPU was kind of the device that you know inspired all of this. Um, it's not the perfect device. It's not, you know, it's not going to solve all your problems, right? But it does, you know, have some unique things that are really powerful, right? It's got thousands and thousands of, you know, very kind of I call them dumb cores that are then managed by an SM core. Um, if you have a, you know, V100, it's it's much more capable. It's got much more. It's got a much higher number of SM cores now than it did when if you had a K80. Um, and the fact that you can fit that in a small footprint is, you know, really a, a big wow factor um, when you can bring in a 4U kind of, you know, mini pod and take out, you know, a rack of Teradata or leave that up, but a rack of whatever solution, right? Like that is, um, 
for, for on-prem, for focusing on-prem stuff, you know, there's a lot of value there, not just from the performance aspect, but just your total TCO. Um, the way we kind of have brought our products, you know, through time is, is really from a heritage of doing table scans, right? Like it was initially a really great table scan engine and that's what the GPU is great at, right? That brute force kind of complex aggregate, complex filter. Um, what we've done since then is really built around, built around that basic idea, a whole lot of instrumentation, a lot of data orchestration that allows us to do it more intelligently because obviously just doing that all the time has its limitations. On the downside, the GPU for analytics so for ML, it's great, right? Because it's most ML uh, workloads are not that data intensive, right? They're more compute intensive. Think about Monte Carlo simulations, right? You bring a small amount of data over the PCI bus, and then you do all of this compute straight onto the GPU. With analytics workloads, it's very different, right? The, you know, you have to bring over a lot of data to drive the actual compute, right? And so that PCI bus becomes a tremendous bottleneck um, because you know if I got to bring in a if I got to send a terabyte of data to you know a two-node cluster of GPUs, and my PCI bus can only do you know 11 gigs, I mean just right there you can do the math. That's you're not going to go any faster than that, right? Um, so you know there's been movement there on uh, kind of alternative uh, platforms like with Power, they have their NVLink bus, and you know Ellie's going to touch on that. But even still, it, it is the number one bottleneck that we face for analytic workloads because it. it for, for most of the operations on the compute side, the GPU can just, it's, it's, not really, uh, it's not really much of an effort for the GPU to blow through the compute. It's really just getting it there and then you know, being able to orchestrate that. And on the topic of orchestration, the GPU as a compute device compared to the CPU, it's, it's pretty primitive in that like, you have basically no scheduling instrumentation, right? So um, there's a heuristic, like basically based on how you size your kernel, um, and what GPU you're using, the, the SM processors are gonna schedule it how they best see fit. So it's a combination of the NVIDIA driver and that particular card, you know, whatever version it might be, K80 or V100, right? So if you compare that, compare that to what you can do with a CPU, I mean, that's, that's crazy. I mean, no one would expect, um, you know, their, one of their primary compute devices to have, you know, so little scheduling implement, uh, instrumentation. And on the resource management front also, again, it's, it's it's very primitive. It's very early days. You can't do fractional allocations of of, um, of a GPU right now. Like if, you, if any of you guys play with Kubernetes um, or Mesos, I mean, you already can see that. Look, you know, the GPU is still nascent there, and you can't do fractional deployments of a GPU in your pod. You have to give entire GPUs because you're doing a PCI pass through, um, and there's just no instrumentation uh, from the NVIDIA driver up into the OS that gives developers a way to instrument it in, in, like, in ways that you can with a CPU, right? I mean, the CPU has, whatever, 50 years of, uh, you know, scheduling and management instrumentation uh, kind of capability baked in where the GPU is still just starting to get there, right? They're, like, they're, they're just trying to start to tackle these problems, and that's only if you can afford the latest cards, right? So it's not, it's not a perfect device, but it's extremely powerful. It gives you a lot of kind of processing capability in a small footprint. Um, and if you can work around some of the barriers like, like you know, the, the PCI bus, which we spend a lot of time, you know, figuring out different methods of how to either send less data, right, with um, kind of like a cache eviction handshake where you keep stuff on VRAM or compress stuff and send it, send it compressed over the bus. Um, these, are, these are workarounds, but it, you know, it, sometimes, you know, the workarounds don't work and you're gonna have to pay that penalty. All right. Yeah. Uh, All right. Otherwise, I'll get we'll, be, I'll get we'll be tied together. Yeah. Any questions so far? Well, I'll take this on and stuff. So, um, I assume the whole solution is to make sure you keep a lot of data on aggregate memory of all these GPUs. Uh, yeah, so we, we actually have a kind of a shared nothing style uh, data, sh you know data uh, layout and Ellie's going to dive deep into into that and how we uh, how we organize it within each node um, 
I don't want to say it's really. Yeah, but just to answer your question, we, we try to keep the data on the GPU, but yeah. most of the time with the customers and the, and the amount of data we're dealing with, there's not enough GPU memory to be able to satisfy a query. And your typical GPU has 12 gigs of VRAM, right? And, you know, your, your system memory is obviously an order of magnitude, you know, more in capacity there. And, and the kind of workloads that, you know, we, you know, are trying to uh, solve for, they, they just can't fit on VRAM, right? And there, there are some solutions that try to focus on just fitting it all in VRAM, uh, which is fine and good, but for the for this kind of problem set that we're tackling, it, it's not, it's not uh, you know, realistic from a financial standpoint. So Nima gave a, an overview of the of Kinetica as a company and where we came from and the uh, the general outline of the product and the and the um, problems. Oh, oh, sorry. You said that the main watch bank was the NV thing. So the the most prevalent one is is the PCI Gen three bus and that that is that is the most painful one. I mean, compared to NV Link, NV Link is much faster. Um, it's it's like what ninety now. Uh, yeah, we get we measure about sixty gigabytes a second. Yeah, I think NV Link Two is some order, it's some another big step up there. But I mean, it's a, you can't, you don't really see Power Nine and NV Link Two out in the wild right now. I mean, it's also very, it's it's rare to see power. I mean, it's like, you know, ten percent of deployments are power, right? The overwhelming amount is x86, and Intel is not moving on PCI right now. Okay. Um, also, uh, have, so to remove the memory transfer mm -hmm. bottleneck, uh, have you looked into integrated uh, DPU where you would not need to? Oh, so you're asking about uh, integrated GPUs. So the, the problem there is that, yes, they're integrated, and they look like they're integrated from that perspective, but those systems are very limited in memory at that point. Um, either, and, and there's no free lunch, so it's still transferring data. It's just kind of hidden from, from the developer. So I'm going to go into some of the, the kind of guiding principles behind the design of the Connecticut database, and then we'll dive into we'll dive a little deeper into the architecture as well. So the kind of the main principle that we have, you know, we're 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 all about performance here, and so what we want to do is we want to use all the available computing resources. So we're we're we want to focus on performance. We definitely want to focus on scalability, scale out, uh, and concurrency. You know, we have, we've got kind of large large workloads, but we also have lo the, lots, of, uh, lots of concurrent workloads. So what we want to do is we want to use all the, the, uh, the um, computing resources that we have. So we have CPUs and we have GPUs available. So we don't want to run everything on GPUs or everything on CPUs. We want to kind of u do the best, you know, use the best mix for the job. Right, and we're trying to walk that fine line on the data structure side where it's, it's beneficial enough to, to make a difference, right, but not so uh, punitive when a mutation comes in that you know, we're going to fall into that common pitfall uh, where, you know, in this new kind of, you know, problem space where data is constantly coming in, just us maintaining the data structures is going to bring us to a halt. Right. So CPUs are great for general purpose computing tasks, you know, map lookups, indexes, anything that's branch heavy, complex data structures. GPUs, on the other hand, I mean, they're, like Nima said, they're kind of dumb cores. You might have 5,000 cores, but they're very simple. And it's, uh, it's SIMT, it's single instruction, multiple thread. So all those cores are basically working on the same problem on a different piece of data at the same time. So it's really great for things like sorting data, scanning data, just crunching through data. Um, things like very simple data structures. You know, GPUs work on vectors, on matrices. You know, very simple, but nothing complex. Like, there's no hash map that works on a GPU, or at least not directly. And any kind of path-dependent algorithm falls apart on the GPU, right? You need to have kind of brute force, uh, you know, no, no path, no branching kind of algorithms that um, you, can, you can launch, you know, via vectorized kernels. So, the, uh, you know, going along with this, you know, we're a distributed system, so we're, we're across multiple machines, you know, a whole, a, 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 an entire cluster. So we really need to encourage data locality. So we want to minimize data movement across the network. So we have a lot of ways that, that uh, users can tune the, uh, the way that their tables are distributed across the database. We call that sharding. So you can shard your data. You can replicate small tables. We want to basically not have to move data between nodes because that's very, very expensive. Um, so we want to keep joins local whenever possible and, and uh, basically minimize data movement across the network. Yeah, and from a developer standpoint, it's, it's, it's a sharding system like any other. If you don't define a shard, we'll round robin it, and you know we'll we'll do our best to you know do the query, including the extra data movement that, that may incur. Um, but what what we try to I don't know 
recommend is you know doing sharding setups that you know reduce that data movement as much as possible. So uh, if you take your kind of classic snowflake schema, um, traditionally you've got a massive fact table right that's constantly growing, and then your dimension tables are usually something we would recommend being replicated so that um, they're they're not small; they're in the hundreds of millions, maybe or you know ten to fifty or ten to a hundred, but uh, they're small enough that you can still replicate them and not have to incur that, you know, I.O. penalty across your cluster. So, yeah, so we want to, you know, minimize data movement both across the, across the cluster, but also from the CPU to the GPU, as Nima mentioned before. So typically this is the biggest overall bottleneck when we're, when we're actually going to process queries. Um, you know, the, for, for x86, it's the PCIe bus. Uh, we get about, you can get about 10 gigabytes a second achievable bandwidth. Uh, on the IBM power systems with NVLink, you can get 60 gigabytes a second, and that, that will grow with, uh, with the Gen 2. But basically, the principle that we're trying to adhere to is only move the data that you need to satisfy the query. So this, of course, implies you know, column-oriented processing. If you're, only, you know, if you're, if you're filtering on, on X, you should only be copying the X column to the GPU. That's, we want to minimize movement wherever possible. And, and uh, like you mentioned before, we, we definitely want to cache data on the GPU when possible. Um, and then... At, at, when, when it's possible, we want to copy data that's already been compressed, whether dictionary encoded or other methods, copy the compressed data and decompress it on the GPU or operate in the compressed domain when possible. So I'm wondering, uh, what does cache the data on the GPU when possible really mean? So like when you are executing a query, the query, of course, is, is fetching some user data or GPU, and then you're just going to leave data there as much as possible? Or Correct. Or yeah, so the question was about caching data on the GPU, and and yeah, so if you if someone did a query on you know on table one on table T, and they they looked at column X, you know we copy column X to the GPU, we did whatever query they wanted to do. Uh, if we don't need that room on the GPU, we'll leave that column there. And so the next query that comes out, if it's also going to be running on that column X, it's already there. We don't have to um, we don't have to copy it again. Right, so there's like, it's basically like an LRU cache, right, where the subsequent query will say, like, if you have such and such chunks there, and you'll reply, you know, I've got, you know, these two, but, you know, you got to go grab the others and send them down. So, um, you know, Nima mentioned a little bit about the challenge of, of programming GPUs. And, um, you know, they, we have, it's, a, it, it's a different way of thinking about programming. So with GPUs, you know, there's no for loops. You're never looping over your records. You have to map everything into parallel programming primitives. So when you're writing a kernel, you can think of the kernel as that, that's the thing that's running inside your loop, but you're never actually executing that loop. The loop is being scheduled across your GPU, and you're getting that, that, uh, that behavior uh, across, the, uh, across the entire device. So what we want to do is when we're writing kernels, when we're, when we're writing our, our processing kernels, we want to stick to parallel programming primitives. So things like sort, transform, prefix summer, scanning, uh, reduction, scatter, gather. So when, you're, when, we're de when you're dealing with processing kernels, whether it's computing aggregates, whether it's joining data, we have to always think about these, these, uh, these primitives and how we can use them to, to best process the data. And then the other thing that we, the other guiding principle that we that we go by is to follow established standards. So that means following SQL or SQL 92. Um, we don't support all the transaction mechanisms that uh, that SQL that SQL provides. Uh, we do have somewhat of a transactional guarantee in that when you insert data into the database, when you've when that insert has completed, when you've gotten a response back, that data is in the database. It's ready to be queried, and it's it's fully operational. There's right. no there's no background processing or anything like that to to yeah, get it ready. What we found was for OLAP workloads, that's enough of a transactional guarantee to take away some of the frustrations around you know uh, what we've seen with with other solutions where you do your mutation, you have no guarantee when that mutation is going to be represented in any follow-on query. With us, because of our underlying mechanism all being uh, HTTP RESTful endpoints. We kind of use that request response cycle as a transactional mechanism to say, look, you make a call, it's going to block until it's been put to the memory store and to disk, right? And when it comes back, any subsequent query is going to have that represented uh, in its result set, right? So for a single-threaded kind of workflow, it, it, it's a it, it's it's more than enough for OLAP workloads, right? Um, what it's not is you know kind of a, a multi-process, um, you know. Advanced transactional system with rollbacks, with rollback, which is what you know the past forty years of solution has been focused on and already kind of does very well. 
So right, so we're we're really focused on OLAP. So we've added in support for some of the newer OLAP features that uh, that that newer versions of SQL provide, and and uh, some of them are vendor specific, uh, and some of them are, are pretty standard. But we support uh, window functions, pivot, unpivot, cube, rollup, basically any any of the uh, OLAP kind of aggregation functions that uh, that people are used to. We uh, we support. Uh, of course, we support ODBC and JDBC connectivity. Most of our users are connecting via ODBC or JDBC. Uh, we do have a native API that we support that I'll go into a little bit more later. And for that, we use Avro serialization. So that's an uh, Apache project. And for rendering, we follow uh, the, um, the OWS standards of WMS, WFS, and, uh, and the newer uh, vector tile standard. So we're, we're following all the standards wherever possible. Uh, for geospatial processing, we support the ST functions that have been popularized by PostGIS and other databases like that. Yep. One more note on like kind of a, we're focused on OLAP, but we do uh, we have spent time uh, making sure that there's certain kind of OLTP like functionality uh, that works at a at a very high scale to kind of unlock or, or show off you know the OLAP capability because you actually kind of need some you know. Ex Highly performant OLTP style capability to be able to work it against this, this you know problem that we've been talking about. Like so, um, most notably, yes, we talked about insertions constantly coming in and being able to do that at scale, but also updates and upserts, right? Um, if you think about data streaming in, a lot of it is around like you know enrichment of a certain entity, right? Where they, they're constantly learning new things about a certain entity and they want to upsert on that record if, if it doesn't exist, right? Um, having that be able to stream in and, and keep Keep up with that, and then have aggregates being queried against that same table um, is, you know, a, a requirement of you know being able to solve this kind of new problem that we've been talking about. And you know, you would more classically define those kind of capabilities as, as more of an OLTP or you know, um, you know, high performance OLTP problem rather than an OLAP problem. But um, you know, it's our belief, you know, where we're talking about inserts, updates, and you know, uh, a linearly scaling lookup capability. You have to have those to be able to kind of uh, really get full value out of that OLAP capability. Okay, before I get into the architecture, any any questions on that? Okay, so going into the architecture. Sorry for the coloring here. Hopefully, it's not too hard to uh, to read. But the uh, the basic idea is we're a distributed database. So each one of these kind of tall boxes here is a what we call a rank or a process. So these processes are running maybe on the same machine or distributed across your cluster. For instance, when we're doing development work, we'll typically run the head rank and one worker rank just on our laptop. And it's basically, it's the full database. We can do everything that we do. Uh, but for actual deployments, you know, we scale out. And so this might be 10 or 20 machines with maybe 40 to 100 ranks or processes. Uh, each rank, each of the worker ranks is responsible for one GPU. So that's kind of the way we map processes to hardware. So your node may have four GPUs or eight GPUs or two GPUs, and we'll have one rank or one process for each GPU. The, uh, the head rank, that's, our, that's a kind of our head node. Our, you know, we, the, the main function there is it has our HTTP server. So everything comes in via a REST API. Um, the, the head rank is responsible for input validation, error handling, uh, metadata storage, some global synchronization. Uh, but it doesn't store any actual data. No records are stored in the head node. It's really just a kind of an I.O. coordinator. The actual data is, is uh, stored in columns in the worker ranks. And I'll go a little bit deeper into those. Um, and then as far as how you interact with the database, everything is coming via a REST API. We have uh, native uh, language bindings for all the popular programming languages. Well, not all, but many of them. So we have APIs for Java, Python, C++, C Sharp, uh, JavaScript, and Node, and we're we're adding more um, as need, as as their as our requests come in. The other way that people interact with the database is via ODBC or JDBC, and so we have a, a we provide an ODBC server that um, that basically translates into our native API calls. Right, so users will still install like a classic ODBC client. That client talks to our our server that we've developed that speaks ODBC wireline takes that and basically converts it to native driver calls. So you know the, the database itself continues to get those RESTful calls, even though the client is getting a, a fully native ODBC uh, experience. right? So this allows us to integrate. And JDBC is the same pattern. 
because it allows us to integrate with you know the tableaus of the world and you know a, a lot of other legacy and non-legacy applications where um, even though I didn't really think it was it, you know I haven't been using a lot of JDBC prior prior to you know building this or ODBC prior to building this um, it's still everywhere um, so you know when I first built Kinetica I thought that the native bindings were was the way to go and that was like so much easier and, and to me you know so much more intuitive but I was dead wrong um, basically you know SQL ODBC JDBC these these kind of common pathways are are very prevalent and probably getting more popular yeah enterprises have just piles and piles of SQL code and that that they're not they don't have any appetite to rewrite it right. one other thing to just mention there um, is, is the host manager so um, host manager is actually a, a separate process um, that is responsible for being the supervisor fabric across the cluster, right? And is also a distributed init system, right? So rather than try to wrap around like a system D um, or, you know, wrap around like, you know, other, you know, systems, both not application level monitoring services or tools that you find in a common Linux stack, we, we wanted to roll our own because we could do more advanced supervision. And we could do more advanced in it that you know makes more sense for Kinetica. So this this idea of host manager um, is you know what we've rolled out in, in just you know late last year, um, and, and it's actually the one that's responsible for spinning up the actual database. Yeah. So basically, this this um, is talking more to what what Nima just yes. mentioned. But yeah, it's basically it's it's supervising, it's it's managing that, it's spinning up new instances. Yeah, it, it actually You're, spawns the, the database processes so that it can catch it can catch signals, right, and and do and mitigate that. Uh, so if it catches you know a signal where you know the, the database has gone down, it's going to try to or that process has gone down, it's going to try to bring it back up. It's going to tell all the other host managers about it, um, and essentially. Um, it allows us to have a, a clear state from a, at the process level um, what's going on in the database and, and having you know the ability to have uh, very intricate kind of supervisor patterns. Uh, I mentioned data distribution and data locality before. So the uh, the sharding of tables were distributed. So you know making sure we distribute the data properly is uh, is a key concept. So the typical way that is uh, data comes into the head node. And then it's distributed out to the worker nodes, the worker ranks. Um, now we have a concept of we, what we call TOMs or shards, basically partitions of data. You can have one or more of these TOMs per per rank, and the sharding model basically lets you know, lets you direct, kind of in a deterministic manner, uh, the records with a certain value go to a particular TOM. So that's important for for joins. So for instance, if you have two large tables that you're going to be joining on one or two columns, then you'll need to shard on one or both of those columns so that the records with the same data go to that same go to the same tom so they're living in the same tom. So the data is local there. Or what is tom? Like, like, I know it's, it's a data container. It's a, it's a, it, was originally type, it was originally a class that was to be specific around type object management and, yeah. and it kind of grew and grew. It's just the name stuck. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it was a great nickname and it just stuck. You didn't like Andy? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, maybe we'll change it after. And that. we we don't have any developers named Tom. So. And and as far as how you specify the shard key, here's a quick example of, of what the DDL looks like. So it should be mostly familiar. But the uh, the things to point out is you know you might you have your columns and what the type of the column is, whether they're nullable or not. You can specify a shard key. This is one or more columns which determines the way that the data is routed, the way that the data is, is uh, assigned to a particular TOM. And notionally, the algorithm is you know, take the value of the shard key. So if you have a record that comes in with a test ID of 5, then basically what we do is hash that value and then mod it by the number of TOMs, and that tells you which TOM to go to. Uh, that's not exactly how it goes there, because that, that doesn't work as far as uh, an um, elastic system and scaling it up and down, but it's notionally that's, that's what we do. Uh, you can specify a primary key as well. The primary key gives you uniqueness constraint. What do you actually do? What's that? What do you actually do? So the way we do it is uh, it's kind of similar to some, some other databases. About uh, We basically have a number of hash slots. So think of uh, uh, some thousands of slots. You take the, uh, take the value, you mod it, or sorry, you hash it, and that gives you a slot. And then we have a number of slots that are assigned to a tom. So then as you, as you scale out and you have more toms, then you move certain of these slots over. So 
It's kind of like consistent hashing, it's but a virtual nodes. That's what it sounds like. Yeah, it's similar. Yeah, it's actually similar how, how Mongo does it. Okay. Yeah. But but the general idea is you're only moving a portion of the data as you, and you get as you get more and more. And all that logic too, or it's like all the client APIs when they initially connect, they get the map, they get all, and they have the logic built in so that when it's time to do a mutation, all that routing uh, calculation is done on the client side, leveraging the client compute. Um, that way, the the routing decision is made up front, and it's going direct to a node rather than you know going to a single node and then getting uh, on our side and getting rerouted. So this allows us to get that linear scale on the ingestion front. And then a couple other things to note on the DDL. So there's ways to specify properties for your columns to tune the memory usage. So for instance, uh, this column is is annotated as store only, and what that means is that you know we're gonna we're gonna get records that have this column in it, this value in it but we're not going to keep them in memory. They're just going to be stored on disk. And so you can't do any aggregates on those columns. You can't do any kind of queries on them, but they're there. They can, you, can re, you can return them back. Sorry. And, um, and, and they're, they're there. They're carried with the data, but you're not going to waste memory on columns that you don't care about. Um, you can annotate text columns as text search, and then we have a, basically a, a, um, a full text search engine that, uh, that works alongside the database to be able to do wildcard searching and, and that kind of stuff. And then we have, uh, you can annotate certain columns as dictionary encoded. So these are for you know, low to medium cardinality columns. We don't have that many unique values. We'll, we'll use dictionary encoding and really uh, reduce memory usage that way. Uh, just a couple words on the sharding constraints. So uh, this should be you know, pretty, uh, pretty common to other databases as well. But the shard key, whatever you're sharding on, should have sufficiently high cardinality uh, so that you distribute to all the toms. Uh, and if the cardinality is not sufficient, or if you have you know, lots of records that happen to go to one tom, you, can, you could get a, a, a poorly balanced cluster. You, know, we, we, uh, you could have a skew, basically. Um, as we mentioned before, tables can be replicated uh, to really uh, help with joins. And this, this, is, uh, this makes sense for di smaller dimension tables, where you can just have an entire copy at every tom. Yeah, I mean, what we've seen is that you know, your classic snowflake you know, schema, the, the dimension tables, I mean, they can get big, but they're not in the billions. I mean, your fact table is in, you know, can be huge and constantly growing. The dimension table is usually, you know, they're, they're sub one billion. Um, so, you know, it, it's and it, it's something that you know we're we're kind of with seven allowing you to fully, you know, without having to do the the you know the best case sharding or, or replication, just do it, and we'll take we'll move the data around for you. But, um, you know. It's something we encourage because it just it, it makes the, the, the you know the workload a, a, a lot more efficient. So I want to get back to the encoding a little bit. So you mentioned that the user can specify, hey, I want to do dictionary encoding if the cardinality is low. Mm -hmm. I wonder, is there any like uh, some default compression mechanism or encoding mechanism you automatically apply to reduce the amount of data you do transfer, or just specify whatever you want? You can you specify what you want. So you can you can specify columns as dictionary encoded. You can you can uh, specify columns to be compressed as well. So I didn't show that in the DDL, um, and that's something that's an area that we're kind of continuously improving. It's an open area, you know, compression that are that are GPU friendly. So dictionary encoding uh, is one of those. So that's the the primary. That so if you have a a uh, string column that's low cardinality, you can you know massively reduce your memory usage that way. Just a uh, kind of distribution example. Again, it might be a little hard to see with the uh, the coloring, but if you think of uh, if this is a, one of your worker ranks and you've got in here two two toms or two of our shards on that rank, you have a uh, fact table. You know, a shard of that fact table will be in each of those toms. Replicated tables, the entire table will be at that tom. And you know, we're column oriented as we said before. And what we do within the tom, within each partition, is we break data into chunks. And that's the chunk is kind of the, is the uh, fundamental unit that we operate on when we go to do the actual processing. So here I'm showing a chunk size of three records. Typically our chunk size is eight million records, but that's a tunable parameter. And for each chunk, we keep metadata around each column, right? That allows us to skip chunks um, when appropriate. Right. So I'll get into a little bit of the data processing. How do we actually execute queries? How do we use the GPUs? Oh, question. Oh. Um, from a, a database management perspective, it often takes uh, several iterations or constant iterations to reshard the system. 
right? The, oh, this does not work for my application, and we'll have to do it again. So what is it, what is it to evolve when the administrator changes the sharding scheme? Yeah, so if you change the sharding scheme, you know, we, you, we can kind of do it in place. You know where we'll take the table and we'll basically make a copy of the table and insert the you know and, and then reinsert the records into the shard that they belong. So you can do that, or you can just create a new table and do a insert into basically. Yeah, I mean, if you look at our architecture diagram, one thing that's not there is you know, each of those uh, processes have a, a you know high per high performance messaging path to every other node, so that they can do things like the resharding where they're not going to the head node. They're they're going to you know, direct to, to the appropriate uh, Tom on another node in another process, uh, insert the resharded record. But basically, we're, we're shipping data around to, 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 to where you. To rebalance. Yeah. Know. Correct. Yeah. yeah, you're basically network limited at that point. Network and And, I and, know, and I mean, disk. If, so. yeah, I mean, if, if the table is persisted, right, and you're resharding, it's going to have to get re persisted. So as I mentioned before, we process data by chunk. That's our fundamental unit of processing. Yes, sir. So if a rank becomes unavailable for some extended time, is the data automatically resharded, or is there some intervention required? Right now, with, what, with our, our current release, if a rank goes down during operation, we just we end the rank. We end that operation, and we, we, we focus on bringing the rank back up and getting the cluster to a healthy state. And, and that's what the host manager does today. We're, we're looking at you know different options and kind of remediation uh, instrumentation to give to the user. But today, you know, if I'm doing a query and one of the ranks is down, we just, the query just, you know, throws an exception and get an error back. So I'm trying to finish up the five minutes. Okay, okay we'll, we'll, I'll race through these. So, um, yeah, we process data by chunk. That's the fundamental unit. As I said before, that's by default 8 million records. It can be tuned as necessary. Now, we do process multiple chunks in parallel. So we process multiple chunks concurrently. And you know, chunks from other toms and ranks are all being processed concurrently as well. Just want to emphasize that we've got multiple levels of parallelism. So we've got parallelism across the cluster. We've got chunks going across the entire cluster. I keep hitting this microphone, sorry. And then we do have parallelism within a chunk by lever leveraging the uh, vectorized execution, whether on the GPU or on the CPU. We're, we're using you know, the multiple threads available to process that chunk. And so depending on the query and depending on the data, we may process we, we may do the processing on the CPU or the GPU or both. So for instance, if it's a small amount of data, we may just process it on the CPU because it's not worth it to copy to the GPU and to you know, run a kernel in GPU and then copy the data back when it's, you know, we can just do it right on the CPU. Uh, if there's many concurrent queries, we may want to do some on the CPU, some on the GPU if the GPU is busy. And we have you know, heuristics built in to basically tune that behavior. And you know, as far as you know, what happens in the CPU versus what happens on the GPU. So CPUs, the CPU does you know, query parsing, input validation, all the metadata maintenance, disk persistence, uh, index lookups, index joins, so hash joins, uh, most many geospatial functions. So GPUs aren't great for variable length data. And if you think of geospatial data, if you've got shapes or tracks or points or lines, you know, that's very variable, that's variable length data. And GPUs aren't great at that. So for a lot of those functions, uh, we do them on the CPU. Uh, full text search, that's all done on the CPU. So as far as GPU, what do we do there? So we do equijoins. That's basically our, our sort merge join. Uh, GPUs are fantastic at sorting. So that, that, uh, you know, that's one of the areas that the GPU really, really shines. What we call predicate joins, or nested loop joins, when you've got a general join condition. We do that looping, you know, not via a for loop, but using the vectorization available in the GPUs to, uh, to do that, that, uh, that nested loop. Uh, fixed length string processing, you know, we, uh, we, um, we can do that all on the GPU for fixed length. So you might have a care eight, you know, an eight length string or a 16 length string or whatever it is. That's fixed length and the GPUs can do that really, really well. Uh, all of our aggregations and window functions, analytic functions, those are all done on the GPU. The GPU is, is that's really the bread and butter of where we get, get a value from the GPU. And rendering, all the, all the rendering, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit about next. Um, and then, oh, just a quick note. So we process data by chunk, and then we have to merge those chunk results hierarchically to get a final result. So you know, we merge data from the, uh, the chunks within a tom, 
We merge data from the toms within a rank and from the ranks across the cluster. And these results might be things like, it might just be simple counts if you're doing a filter. They might be you know, result tables if you're doing a group by, and they might be images if you're doing visualizations. But that's the, uh, this hierarchical merging uh, architecture is used uh, by all of our operations. Any questions on that before I jump to visualization? And I, I, yeah, I know we're a little bit over time here, so I'll try to, try to rush through here. Uh, just going over the, our basic visualization pipeline. The basic idea is you know, we copy the data to the GPU if it's not already there. If these might be latitude and longitude data, it might be triangulated shape data. We apply whatever spatial projection and bounding box that the user specifies to map the data into, the screen, into screen space. We pass these through an OpenGL or an EGL shader pipeline. Uh, so we use a geometry shader to do things like convert points and lines into quads. So we can do things like apply dotting and dashing textures to them. We, uh, we run a fragment shader to apply various styling options. You know, for points, we want to be able to set the shape, fill color, edge color, basically all the styling options. These are all run within OpenGL shaders. And then you know, we get partial results. We get images from each chunk. And then we merge those hierarchically, as I showed in the previous slide. And then finally, basically, PNG, PNG compress the final image and ship it back to the client, which is typically a, a uh, JavaScript web service or something like that. So we, uh, we include a full-fledged WMS server. WMS is a web mapping service. It's kind of a standard way to, to, to request images from a remote, from a remote URL. Uh, we also support WFS and vector tile. But we basically, it'll basically return an image corresponding to a view of a particular table or multiple tables over a specific region with whatever styling options that the user specifies. And under the hood, we're using CUDA and we're using OpenGL for performance. And just an example of what a request looks like, it's just a, you know, you can do this via curl, you can do this via your browser. You hit the website, you, you hit the Kinetica host, our standard port, and the uh, WMS endpoint with all the various parameters to, to define what you actually want. And if you have styling options, they'll, they'll be listed here as other you know, uh, URL parameters. So what kind of renderings do we support? We support what we call feature rendering or raster rendering. So this is an you know, example of points or shapes. So this is all OpenGL accelerated. So you know, we're showing the states here. But as Nima mentioned before, you, know, you may have millions and millions of of uh, footprints or you know whatever geospatial footprints. If you're a utility company, it might be you know a location of every one of your transformer boxes, every one of your utility poles. So the op leveraging open OpenGL means we can run you know millions and millions yeah, of, of gas points. Lines or electric lines or you know ro a road network or you know your your, uh, your cell tower network. Um, you know, these are all kind of very complex features that you know can can get very uh, complex to, to render at scale. Uh, we support heat map rendering. These are basically density plots. So you, this is uh, you can see like you know this. I think this is a uh, like location of tweets, and you can see that you know hot spots in city centers and things like that. But basically, it lets you summarize all your data in one image, and you be able to, you can see like we see where the activity is happening. Uh, we support class break rendering or chloropleth, and the idea here is you know you render your shapes or you render your points, and you style them based on some some column or some other value. So this might be showing, I think this is showing state by population. But basically this is all happening within the database, within a WMS call, using the, the standard uh, pipeline that I mentioned before and all the underlying data machinery. Uh, one of the things we've recently added in is contour rendering. And so this is a little bit more complicated to do because you can imagine you, uh, you have you know, points distributed across your cluster. And so we've got to basically do partial results at the tom level, at the chunk level, and then merge those back and come up with a final contour plot. And this is useful for things like oil and gas cus uh, customers who might want to see uh, you know, information about oil wells or whatever other kind of information they'd want to they'd look at. Any, any questions on, uh, on rendering? I think you got to finish up. All right, we'll keep going. Yeah, no, no, you got to finish up. Yeah, so okay. yeah, I think we're, I mean, so we talked about multi-node ingestion and, and we talked about kind of the, the, the routing system and, and the mapping system that we use. It's the same thing on the, on the key lookup side. Um, again, you know, the reason why we spent time on this is that because you, you need to have these kind of high performance OLTP classic, trans, you know, capabilities to, you know, drive your, and unlock the value of your OLAP capability. Um, you know, we've, we've uh, 
on the mutation side, we've gotten to billions of mutations uh, per minute on relatively small clusters, and on the lookup side, you know, yeah, have done pretty well. Not you know top level YCSB well, but um, you know that's not necessarily because of uh, the lookup capability, but more of the, the transport. So. Um, yeah, thanks so much for uh, having us. Andy, really appreciate the invite. Um, and, you know, uh, we're, we'll be around for any questions or yeah. anything you guys want to talk about. All right, thank, thank you. All right, we have time for two questions. Again, repeat the questions so it picks up the mic. Sure, yes, sir. And do you compile queries to native code? Like so the, the question is do we compile queries to native code? And currently we do, we do not. So that's on our roadmap. Um, but we don't. We, uh, we, we, we operate off, we kind of have, you know, fundamental low-level operators that we map queries to. So we, you know, we come up with like an execution plan and map it to that, to these low-level primitives, but they are not fully compiled. Any other questions? Uh, do we do any scheduling on GPU or is it cannot? It does not have the feature allow, allow it to do yeah, it. You, so, the, sorry, the question was yeah. about scheduling on the GPU. Yeah, you, you don't really have a lot of... Um, instrumentation there. NVIDIA gives you a kind of a, a kernel sizing heuristic, right, that um, kind of can give a certain kernel priority over others, but yeah, it, it, it's, not, it's not nearly what you have on the GPU. Now you can do things like have mul multiple streams of execution right. on the GPU, so you have multiple, so if you think about how we process by chunk, each chunk we're processing in its own CUDA stream. And so we can have multiple ones of these streams happening at the same time. But as far as explicit scheduling, we don't have much control over that. And the behavior changes from card generation to card generation. So we, we have to do our own scheduling layer on top of that. Like we don't want to have 40 chunks all hit the, G, the same GPU at, at once. So we have our own scheduling layer on top of that, but it has to, it has to work around the GPU limitations. All right, let's thank the speakers one more time. Let's take a trip to the far side and black suits troops the group on the stalk And the uncivilized island of New York where the criminals run the project development through drug spots I be sleeping through the screens and rapid by shots My block consists of multiple juvenile offenders and their crews I'm telling you, even precincts get this Zone these kids making fix, peep this Operation safe home ain't shit Giuliani got these perpetrating housing cops on the dicks Now ain't this a bitch?